right, welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger, and today we're talking about the chaos order dialectic and ancient origin myths. How are these two things related, Greg? (laughs) Well, let's back up to our previous conversation where we saw that there were are only two worldviews ultimately. Either God created the world at the way he said he did, and the time it took him recently, and we have a earth that exists in finite time, at least in one direction. Or the world's always been here. The world is self-existent, self-defining, but seemingly then always changing, unless the change is an illusion. And then we have hard questions of by what standard are you going to tell if it's if the change is real or not, but maybe we can come back to that later. So as we look at throughout the pagan world, we see lots of mythologies that tell us how this phase of the world began. But Emily, you were correct in calling them origin myths. They're not creation myths because none of them speak of a creator. There is no sovereign God who called the universe out of nothing into existence. There's a world ocean, there's a cosmic egg, there's yawning chaos, there's a huge gap between fire and ice. There's something already there. And these origin stories tell us how we got from there to here. The common philosophy of the ancient world is that having gotten from there to here, we may find ourselves cycling back to there eventually. And a view of circular time was certainly common in the ancient world. We rise out of chaos, we return to chaos, and then we're reborn again. And so what does does chaos and order have to do with the ancient way of thinking? Well, pretty much everything. We have pre-existent matter, which may or may not contain some element of sentience. If, If you even want to make that distinction, what exactly is sentience anyhow? Uh, and then it changes, it develops, and becomes something more. Or it seems to, if you are a pantheist, in such cases the changes are illusory, they're not real, they're going to collapse back into the final whatever we want to call it. We've been trained to say God, but it's not God. It's the universe, it's, it's the allness, the oneness of everything, Brahma. So, Greg, last time we talked about time, and it's having a beginning, a definite beginning, when the Bible says it did, that God created the world, that the world is not eternal and self-existent, whereas every pagan origin myth posits that the earth has always been, or the universe has always been in existence, that they have origins, not creation myths, because everything is made up of things that were already there. Where do chaos and order stand in all of this? More generally, the origin myths put chaos at the beginning of everything. Now, why that should be is a little odd. I can only assume it's something about the nature of the image of God in man. We look at this world we have with its what we call order, beauty, structure, and we say, this is better than a garbage dump. This is better than a pile of rocks. (laughs) So... We have progressed progressed out of some kind of original chaotic existence to this order. But the ancient world had no confidence in that order. And they felt that as time looped around, it would all fall apart again. And there's certainly contemporary echoes of this in the oscillating universe theory, where the universe explodes in the Big Bang, accelerates away from itself until gravitation catches up with it, pulls it back in, and you have a big crunch that returns everything to its original singularity and then explodes again forever and ever and ever and ever. But there, there, there is this hidden presupposition that we can distinguish chaos from order and that for some reason this order thing is better than this chaos thing. And why this should be is something, why, we, why we're able, and by what standard we're able to make that judgment is a curious question. And why it should happen is also curious. Mm-hmm. 
I just finished Jordan Peterson's book, which we've talked a little bit about mm-hmm. in the past. But this philosophy, as you mentioned with the, the Big Bang idea and the oscillating universe theory, is very much alive and well. Peterson, especially towards the end of his book, really makes explicit his presuppositions that chaos and order are the ultimate, fundamental, only sure things in the universe. They have always been, will always be, and everything that happens happens in terms of them, including the Bible. Interestingly enough, he he pulls pulls the Bible along with other texts and says this has been the unfolding of human consciousness from the beginning as we try to sort out chaos and order. And so he takes the Bible seriously. He uses the Bible and actually interprets it fairly well at certain points. Like he brings out some ideas because he's thinking archetypically Mm -hmm. that I think a lot of Christians miss, but it's never to the point where he thinks it's actually true in a historical sense. And that's just sort of where it falls off. And I'm like, oh, this is so disappointing. It's so close. (laughs) So is, are are there traces of uh, Carl Jung here? Is he seeing the human mind leaking out its contents into the sacred, various sacred texts so that we get a glimpse of what's really behind everything? Or is, am I missing? I think that's exactly it. The result of th- that Jungianism is this looking to chaos and order as ultimate, I think, for, for Peterson. I don't know if that's the way it goes. I'm not familiar enough with Jung to say that that's how it always goes. But for Peterson, it certainly does. Well, there's only so many possibilities, and we, we, we can trace this kind of thinking back to Plato, who looks for the, the ideals, the archetypes that somehow define all reality, but Plato himself had no idea why or how exactly that worked. There are these ideas that are, and now we're falling into Greek categories, form, mm-hmm. order, but where they came from and how exactly they get imposed upon matter is apparently for Plato anybody's guess. He he suggests kind of allegorically that there's some little demiurge. Who, who's the character in, in Wreck It Roth who keeps saying I can fix it? Fix it, Felix. Fix it, Felix. Yeah, right. The, the, yeah, yeah. There's 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 this little godlike Felix character who can go around and try to force the universe, the, the chaos. And then, you know, we keep saying universe. That's a loaded word too. It implies unity. <laughs> You can say cosmos, but cosmos is a Greek word that means an ordered system that tries to force the chaos into some kind of order. But where do these archetypical ideas come from? What makes them archetypical and why should anyone listen to them? I have thought about clouds. There's a wonderful Peanuts cartoon that I should have brought along with us and, and I didn't. But Lucy and Linus and Charlie Brown are looking up at the clouds. They're lying on a hillside and watching the sky. And Lucy asks... Uh, Linus, what he sees. And he describes a couple of incredibly detailed historical scenes ending with the stoning of St. Stephen. (laughs) And Charlie Brown, Lucy says, Charlie Brown, what do you see? And Charlie Brown says, I was going to see a ducky and a horsey, but I'll think I'll never mind. Uh, We we look at clouds and, and we see patterns oftentimes. But we, as big grown up people, we know, oh, it just looks like that. Um, so how do we know on a larger scale that when we look at something and call it beauty or order or pick a archetypical word, how do we know that that's just not passing mood of chaos? You know, you can, you can throw out glitter or I Ching sticks or whatever. And in a moment as, as, as they pass through time, they can take on all kinds of pretty shapes. They can look like a donkey or a, a ducky or a horsey, but then they fall apart. It was when we say, well, that's just illusion. Yeah. What about everything we see? How do we know that there is something archetypical behind this? How do we n- not know that this is just one of the many moods of chaos that's here for a hundred years, a thousand years, a million years against the vast backdrop of eternity? Why is that form? Why is that order? Why is that any more than cloud gazing? And by what standard are we going to assert that? How do we know that order is orderly? And how do we know that it is of any significance? And why should we value it beyond perhaps the fact that we are used to it? Oh, but wait, who are we anyway? Aren't we part 
of the very chaos that's got sped up from the universe in the first place. And why do our judgments count? Aren't we just used to these things? Aren't we chemical reactions coexisting with other chemical reactions in ways that seem to produce something that we register as uh, acquiescence or pleasure or consent or familiarity? But when our bones are moldering in the grave, where's the order? There are, there are vast assumptions, presuppositions at work behind this. And yet pagan cultures, having no place else to retreat, keep wanting to find order. They want to find truth. They want to find beauty. But they're starting with chaos. How do you bridge the gap? And of course, that's the nature of the dialectic. A dialectic, by definition, is something where you have two different principles, abstract ideas or forces held together but at war with each other, like trying to hold two positive magnets together, they're constantly repelling, constantly pushing away. What is the force? What is the oneness that binds them except the basic continuity of being? All is one. And is that one just at bottom chaos? If you're a materialist, it's atoms in the void, atoms in motion, or energy particles, or whatever you want to call them. If you're a pantheist, then you don't even have that exactly. You have come some kind of spiritual essence, which does not exist in discrete bits, except as we take the illusion seriously, and that in the end, we'll pull everything back into itself. Uh, where, what, is this, what is this order thing anyhow? Why is it so important? And why do we keep looking for it? Why, why is... Jordan Peterson, right? Why is he mm -hmm. seeing clouds in the Bible and in the other sacred texts? Why are these things, why does he say, oh, this is important. This is an archetype. This is something to take note of. This is something we should listen to. As Christians, we need to look at him and say, why? Well, don't you agree? <laughs> yes, but not because of your reasoning. Your reasoning makes no sense. <laughs> you got where we are, but you cheated all the way along. We read the text as a text that tells us certain things about a true God who exists outside of this realm we perceive as, as chaos and order, who, uh, in fact, governs the world in such a way that it is neither chaotic nor uh, some kind of static order, but it is the uh, providential work of a storytelling God who's working all things together for the good of his people and for his own glory. Uh, we do have... We have change, real change. We have real development. We have a story that's in progress. And the order is intentional. It's imposed by the very God who brought the matter into existence in the first place to be exactly what it is. It's not an accident. These things are not at odds with one another. They are both aspects of God's providential rule over the universe, stemming out of his eternal counsel and predestination. So we're quite comfortable with all this, and we're not surprised to see our Father's hand, mm -hmm. even down to saying, isn't it great that God just made that cloud that looks like a dragon so we could smile at it and laugh for a second? Because he really, really did. Uh, the, the things that, that fall by seeming accident into some pattern that we recognize. And sure, we can talk about Brownian motion and all of the physics behind the accidental fall of the, of the glitter or the paint. And yet as Christians, we can also say, God has a sense of humor. Look at that smiley face that just showed up when everything fell. God did that. And both are true. So yeah. we, 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 we have answers that are consistent within our system. He, Jordan Peterson and people like in the pagan world in general, they want order. They sense a need for order because they are made in God's image and they're living in God's universe. And, you know, order kind of is. And you could, in theory, say, I am just atoms. My thought processes are just atoms. I'm just spinning here in the void. Nothing matters. There's no real line of distinction between my atoms and the atoms of that freight train bearing down on me. And you could try to live like that, but nobody does. We all see the train coming and we get off the tracks unless we have suicidal impulses because we know the way the world works. We know about momentum and inertia and big, huge iron things smacking us at 70 miles an hour and what that does to biological units like ourselves. We're, we're very familiar with that order and we can plead all we want that it's an illusion or that we are just atoms and it doesn't really matter and yet we move anyhow. Mm -hmm. And so as the image of God, we take the order seriously, but in rebellion against God, we don't want to admit that he's the source of that order. So we have to do something with it. 
we can pretend it's not there, but more generally, pagan cultures have begun by saying, well, there was this chaos and then something happened. And we could walk through all of the origin myths from Sumer to Egypt to uh, my, my favorite, of course, as you probably can guess, is the Norse mythology. <laughs> uh, and I got a gap, the huge gap between Niflheim, the land of ice and snow, and Muspelheim to the south, the land of fire. And so here's this huge cosmic gap between these two huge cosmic realms. And they're just all sitting there being cosmic and all. And somehow sparks from the land of fire, from Muspelheim, reach into the land of ice and melt them and presumably imparting, well, let's assume that the Norse meant more than they said, and that somehow these sparks are some kind of divine energy imparting sentience or somehow when fire and ice get together, weird things happen. <laughs> and out comes this giant with this cow. And my, the cow. The, the cosmic cow. My students have always laughed at Adumala, the cosmic cow. But it, to the Norse, it, it, well, why well, you need the cow? Because we need cows to provide, you know, milk and stuff. It didn't seem <laughs> funny to them. It seems hilarious or silly to us. Uh, and then as the cow licks the ice and how the cow gets nourishment from the ice is another question, but she does apparently salt and water. Uh, she uncovers the young gods. What does that mean? Does that mean they were there buried? Why? How? Does that mean that her tongue shapes them into existence? We're not told. It's just a story. <laughs> we're not supposed to inquire too closely. But she uncovers uh, these gods uh, who have children, the chiefest of whom is Odin. And the gods turn on the giant and dismember him and make out of his body. Well, his, his flesh becomes the earth and his uh, overarching brow, the heavens and his bones, the rock and his blood, the rivers. Um, I don't remember at all. <laughs> uh, but they create Midgard in the middle of the cosmos between the two the two previous realms. And above that, they set Asgard, which will be their home and connect it with Glimmering by Frostbridge and all of that. By the way, I have a video someplace on the internet, on YouTube, where I sum up that better than I just did. <laughs> you, you can look at it. Here's everybody's lesson Go or uh, homework. Go look for it and see if you can find it. Well, I love that you brought up Norse mythology because Neil Gaiman in his recent retelling mm. brings up a point that I think Christians have been bringing up for a long time is what sets Norse mythology apart is that it has not only a beginning, but an end. Yes, yeah, so it has an eschatology. Yeah. That's technically true. I think it's better to say it's the only one that spends much time admitting that it has an eschatology, <laughs> largely right. because they didn't want to contemplate the other end of things, because we know what the other end of things, even, even the gods die. They just, the Greeks and the Romans and such, the Egyptians just didn't think about that a whole lot, nor did they want to. Uh, they they assumed eternal recurrence. The uh, Norse myths give us, go a little better in that when Ragnarok is finished and the heavens and earth that are sink into the sea, there's the sea again, uh, mm -hmm. what rises out is a new heavens and a new earth. And depending on how much credit you're willing to give to the manuscript evidence, there comes a new great God who will rule over all and set up law and justice. Of course, the pagan scholars, human scholars, could then say that's obvious. It's a reference to Christianity. It was obviously added later, which is possible. Or it may be that they had some kind of hope for something or that some of those myths were not put in their final stage until they encountered Christian missionaries or some kind of early Jewish influence. We don't know, but they did. They did certainly have a positive hope. The gods die. And yet the gods can be reborn. And, but again, this, this is the basic cycle, the, um, the myth of the uh, eternal return, that, that everything will come back again in some form, maybe even in the exact form. We may, have, we may have lived this life and had this conversation a billion, billion times, and we'll never know it and never remember it. Isn't that exciting? How's, <laughs> how's that for hope? Is that Nietzsche yeah. speaking? Nietzsche picked up on it, but it was hardly original with him. Mm -hmm. Whereas over against that, Christianity acknowledges that time has a beginning, but it does not have an end. And Christians miss that sometimes, so a little bit of sloppy exegesis. 
uh, we there's a passage in Revelation where the seventh angel blows his trumpet and swears by God that there will be time no more. But what it's, what the Greek is actually saying is time's up. That's a reference mm-hmm. to the the persecuted martyrs who've been calling out for judgment. They uh, they're told they have to wait a little while until the other martyrs are killed. And when the seventh angel blows his trumpet, he's saying, "Okay, the time's over. Time's up. God's Hurry about up, please. Yeah. It's time." Sorry, that T. S. Eliot reference just completely lost me. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I'll save T. S. Eliot for later. <laughs> yes, hurry up. It's time. Emily's T. S. Eliot's reference, but it, once once we understand that and we look at what we see, what we call eternity future is still temporal. Because man cannot exist outside of time. Man is a temporal creature. Only God is transtemporal. Only God is not bound by time. Only God exists outside of its confines. So we will, just as we will always be creatures, we will always live in time. We will always live in a material world. We will always live in three-dimensional space. These are givens for our existence. There will be a time when we're wearing crowns and there's a moment when we cast them down at the feet of the Lord, even in yeah, eternity. Exactly. There, there, there is progress. We will be reigning, which is an activity, not a static state of existence. So as Christians, we're not afraid of time, but we do recognize that since the fall, time carries with it some very negative things because of the curse. We, the whole creation does groan and travail together in pain, uh, birth pains, waiting for uh, the redemption of the sons of God, the redemption of our bodies, and the uh, new, the transformation that will accompany the whole world when that happens, Romans 8. So we, we have a positive view of time. Jesus has bought back time. He is blessing time. Time is now the, the field of God's operation for redemption. And it's not something we are to um, moan and groan about as if that's bad, as if some kind of uh, abstract stasis, some kind of Neoplatonic timeless existence would be better. It's not that we're not made for that. We can't handle that. We wouldn't understand that. We we will continue. Time is eternal in one direction on into the future. And eternity is something we can't cope with, which is one reason that when the Bible talks about eternity, it doesn't tell us a whole lot. Um, this is something I have fun with sometimes just thinking about it for, you know, a minute and then giving it up. But if we look back on this last century, uh, if we were to take our current technology, well, not mine, I'm kind of Amish, but the kind of stuff that you two <laughs> carry about with you all the time, your, your, your cell phones and laptops and such, and you were to step back into, say, 1870, uh, and your devices still worked, people would think you were probably uh, witches, sorcerers, uh, possibly creatures from another world. There were a few people who were open to the possibility of alien life even then. Possibly frauds. They they would. Yeah, I, I've heard of, of people live, who left lived into the 1930s and 40s who would not have televisions in their houses because such things obviously were impossible and thus me, must be of the devil. Mm-hmm. And they were completely serious. But we've come. My uh, my grandmother on my mom's side was born at the tail end of the 1800s. Her mother was a little girl during the last days of the Civil War. Uh, My grandmother, so, lived from the late 1800s to see the moon landing uh, and died a few years after that. But imagine the world she saw change from horse and buggy, basically, up through, or just maybe just the very beginnings of the automobile. It wasn't a common thing yet up through Neil Armstrong setting foot on uh, on the moon. That's all. And, and, and at that point, we didn't have uh, microchips yet. We The computers that sent men to the moon were not as powerful as the computers we're working with right now. Uh, if you've ever seen the, uh, the movie Apollo 13, which I mostly recommend, uh, <laughs> well, there's one or two awkward scenes up front. You, you see that when they get into trouble, they do calculations with pencil and paper, and you have the ast- ancient. Yes, you have astronauts up in space trying to figure out uh, re-entry angles and such using uh, little golf pencils and and scratch paper. And everybody 
and Houston Control is doing exactly the same thing. That was 69, 1969, uh, in case anyone didn't know that. Uh, and here we are, 2019, almost 2020. We could carry in our, you could carry on some of your watches more technology than those astronauts had. What happens in eternity when the curse is lifted? What will we become? What will we be capable of as we continue to interact with a world of infinite possibilities? I think there are very good reasons that God did not tell us. It would be completely meaningless to us. Uh, we will be as angels. Okay, that's great. I don't know what that means. It, <laughs> it will be wonderful. We will, all of our abilities, and talents will be uh, tasked to the maximum. We will enjoy it infinitely. We will offer it as praise to God. Uh, technology will go exponential for eternity. Not, 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 not a thousand years, not a million years, not a billion years, without end. So there's some things to factor in in a Christian philosophy of time. Uh, we, we hit an exponential curve very quickly after Jesus returns that we can't even begin to fathom. And we just have to trust God and say, it will be incredible. It will be wild. It'll be fun. Uh, but it will be Christ-centered. And it will bring honor to him. And in the meantime, this time is a time for sanctification, for testing, for trial, for... Uh, facing up to hard things and overcoming by the blood of the Lamb. Of Jesus, it is, Jesus said, it said, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things he suffered. There are things that even Christ himself could learn only in the face of suffering. There's a kind of maturity that comes in time, in history, as we face hard things and overcome them in faith. And once Jesus comes, there will be growth of a sort, but it's, the, it's not the kind of growth that happens here. And so this time, before Jesus comes, though it is hard, it is a sanctified time that has as one of its chief purposes the creation, preservation, sanctification, and growth of the church. And although it can be very hard and at times very sad, we can approach it with joy knowing that God has a purpose. And it's only, compared to eternity, uh, a brief time as for a moment. And so here, these are some of the things that are going to play into a Christian philosophy of time. Whereas our, our pagan friends are left with a collapse back into chaos, the fear that, that the death, the heat death of the universe is a really horrible thing and the death of their own bodies is a really horrible thing. But we still have to ask them, and what makes you think so? And in the long, I, I remember a TV show, it's called It Takes a Thief. Nobody needs to go look it up. But there's a there's a scene where the, the hero, a thief, is uh, held by even batter guys. And he's talking to his young lady friend. And um, she says, well, you're not you're not afraid to die. He says, yeah, I don't know what comes after this life. Nothing. Annihilation. Punishment for some of the things I've done. I don't know. But I know that life is sweet. Life is very sweet. Well, there's the pagan world. Life is sweet. <laughs> Uh, so yeah. Socrates was honest enough to say, I go to death, you to life, who knows which is better, because he really didn't know. He, he thought he was going to get to go to an afterlife where he could hang out with Achilles and Odysseus <laughs> and all the, he get to go see all the great heroes of the past. Well, he did, but not the way he thought. And so our, our, our pagan world looks at death mostly with fear and they look at the, any, into the universe is a horrible, terrible thing. And to them, hell is the destruction of the planet, an atomic war, ecological crisis. This is the hell of the humanist. Again, a God-given concept, an inescapable concept. Uh, the eschatology is inescapable and the eternal sanctions are inescapable. But whereas they don't have a God to inflict these things, they trust man to inflict them. Man can, we, we, man can save man. If we have the state enough power, but if we get it wrong, we're going to rule the planet or we're going to blow up the planet or something. We're on the wrong side of history. Yeah. You know, and, and there's nothing worse than that. <laughs> right. Right. Okay. Uh, the scary thing, of course, is that there are now those in the green movement who are saying, well, but the planet would survive and we as a cancer would no longer be there. That doesn't sound so bad to us. But even in their view, eventually the sun, the moon falls and the sun grows cold. 
and there's nothing. Mm -hmm. And they cannot handle the nothing. And so they keep trying to enforce some kind of meaning, some kind of order. And they want to believe that that meaning, that order that they've created, even if they freely admit, oh, we created it, but it's better. And we still have to ask why. And it's going to be short lived and you are going to die. Is that all you got? Is that all there is? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, the circle back to Jordan Peterson, like mm -hmm. I always do. Um, so as you say, this, this pagan concept of the world has no hope. And Jordan Peterson, with all of his good advice and the centuries and millennia of Christian society that he's building on that gives him a borrowed foundation for his good advice, there's, there's really no hope there because he doesn't know that Christ wins in the end. And that has to be our ultimate hope is in Christ that even though this world has suffering in it and that we are promised trials and suffering and persecution, our hope is not in the moments of beauty that we find when we pet a cat as it walks across the street. Our, our hope is in Christ and his return and his triumph. And ultimately we have this joy to look forward to this unimaginable eternity of working to God's glory. I think there are a couple things we need to say. And I'm going to say the, the least important first, because you mentioned petting a cat. Why am I thinking of Nick Fury? Mm -hmm. the, those moments can be beautiful, are beautiful, mm -hmm. be precisely because Christ redeems them. They're one of yes. the, the mm -hmm. Father's good gifts to us. They're, they're that little Sabbath in the midst of the struggles. They're the, the Father's smiling around the corner and reminding us of his love. And they are encouragements and they are glimpses of glory, glimpses of the, of the beauty and creativity of our, of our Heavenly Father. And so because, because we know that Christ wins, these are not throwaway things. And in some sense, they're never lost. Uh, there's a line in um, Rebecca of Sunnybrook Farm, whose author was a Christian. And it's just, it's a passing thing where the narrator uh, adopts just for a second a theological voice and says, and as nothing is ever lost in the king's dominion, and I forget where she goes from there. But the point that she's making is that no good thing ever passes away. God remembers it, will remember it. Uh, and the, that moment of beauty that we experience has changed us, has touched us, and echoes through our being. And we will be talking of that cat that we petted, possibly for eternity, depending on how God orchestrates these things. But it's a good metaphor, at least, for what's going to happen. Schaefer, in, in a couple of his books, I think, addresses the Buddhist idea that man steps into the pond and leaves no ripples, meaning he has no effect on history or anything because nothing's real. And Schaefer says, no, we must insist that man makes ripples that go on forever. Uh, mm -hmm. And this, this, this too, we have to insist. And we must insist it of the smallest things. A cup of cold water in Jesus' name, the Lord says, will not lose its reward. So the end, in a very different sense from the way we usually use the word, does justify mm -hmm. the means, the steps to it, because the end is God's end. And his divine sovereignty and predestination overrules all of our sins and brings beauty and glory in the smallest kind of, of expression of who he is, whether it be a child's finger painting or the petting of the cat or an evening sunset or a storm breaking over the Swiss Alps. Uh, all of these things, twinkle, twinkle, little star, these are all things that are true and real and beautiful, and their meaning is not just transitory, because Jesus wins. Now, here's the other thing. We keep talking about this Jesus version. We haven't got there yet. We haven't even got technically <laughs> to sin. So people, it's just possible that someplace along the line, there might be some non-Christian who we haven't completely offended and driven away by the things we've said, who, <laughs> or someone who thinks they're a Christian, and maybe isn't quite or doesn't quite get it, saying, what, well, okay, so I, when I was a kid, I, I, I walked forward in, in this church and, and I asked Jesus to my heart, but I don't know what in the world that has to do with, with what you're talking about. So let, let's take a moment and, and make things very clear as to who Jesus is. 
We've spoken already in the previous broadcast of this God who exists eternally, a self-existing God, who is three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Father um, begetting from eternity the Son, the Son being begotten, the Father and the Son uh, eternally communicating, loving one another, and breathing back and forth their love in the person of the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, who is also fully and completely, truly God, so that these three are one, but these three are three. And it is the second person of this Trinity, the second person of the Godhead, the Son, who in the Father's goodwill, according to his eternal plan to to save mankind, to glorify his Son, sent his Son into the world as a ransom, as a redemption price for um, those who had rebelled against him, who deserved hell, who deserved eternal wrath. And this one, Jesus, and it's, it's about Christmas season now. We just passed Black Friday, so there's that ominous thing. Uh, <laughs> Jesus, the Son of God, came into the world, taking to himself a true human nature, so that he is God and man, but only one person. And that one person, being God and man, has a life whose value is infinite, has the ability to withstand the full wrath of God against sin, but he's also human, capable of suffering, capable of dying, and capable of representing man. And this man, this God-man, went to the cross, died, penal substitutionary death in the place of sinners, so that those who trust in him do not have to suffer the wrath of God. He did that for us. And then Jesus came back to life. He rose from the dead. He, he was really clinically dead. And then he stopped being dead. Uh, his uh, brain waves came back online. His lungs began respiration again. His synapses started firing. He got up and walked out of his tomb. He was really alive. He beat death. And because of this, that resurrection power is available to us first as he breathes forth his spirit into our existence, into our lives and our hearts, and gives us new life, makes us new creatures, changes us and gives us victory over our rebellion. But ultimately, it is that same resurrection power that will raise our bodies from the dead and that will transform the world. The world is alive with resurrection life. We've turned a corner. Things have changed. Things are not what they were. Uh, there was a time when entropy seemed to have the final word, when sin and death seemed to reign, and there was only the faintest sparks of God's grace in some little obscure corner of the world called Palestine. And now we've turned around, and life and light are spreading through the world, bringing about the restitution of all things. That Jesus. How do we receive this power? We are told that um, as many as received him, to them gave he the authority to become the sons of God, even to those who believe on his name, who are born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. So on our side of things, it's a very simple thing of believing the promise. All these things that we've said, we need to believe that they're true, and that it's a promise that Jesus intends to keep. We trust Jesus to keep his promise. We trust him to forgive our sins. We trust him to change us and to give us new lives. We trust us. We trust him to take our souls to heaven when we die. But far beyond that, to ultimately raise, to reunite body and soul, raise us from the dead when he returns, and put us on this exponential spiral toward glories we cannot understand, joys we've never experienced, we can't imagine. We trust him for all of that, even in the face of very hard times. The other side, of course, is that this is the sovereign work of God. You can't make someone a Christian by simply giving natural birth. Uh, it is not something that the human will comes up with on its own, or not of blood, nor of the will of man, nor of the will of flesh. Someone else cannot do it for you. You can't make someone a Christian. You, there are no wands of conversion. You smack somebody and, wow, they're a Christian. <laughs> it is a personal covenantal relationship with the Son of God who made the universe and who became a baby in the Virgin's womb in Nazareth and was born in Bethlehem about 2,000 years ago. And that's the message of the gospel, and that's the message of the Christmas season. And if you read the Christmas hymns, the carols, 
or listen to them sung, and you read the Christmas prophecies, they are full of, of tra- the language of transformation. Uh, one of my favorites, joy to the world. No more let sins and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow far as the curse is found. Now, Isaac Watts, when he wrote, wrote that, was thinking of the second coming, and yet it's interesting that it got shifted to being a Christmas hymn because it is. Uh, Jesus, in coming into this world, came as a second Adam. Uh, creation, the new creation, began when he entered our world. And so that if any man be in Christ, he is presently a new creation. All things have passed away. All things have become new. And we, we, we've we chosen as our um, our name, halting towards Zion. The book of Hebrews tells us that we are come unto Mount Zion, the city of of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to innumerable company of angels, to the church of the firstborn, who are written in heaven, to God, the judge of all, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. Uh, This is a reality that has already entered our reality. The new Jerusalem is already, the new creation is already here, and it will continue, the newness and the light will continue to grow in time and in history, until finally, when Jesus comes, it will become explicit. Everything will come out from the shadows were hiding behind the trees, as it were, and we will see the glory of God. So this, this is a time, a season to rejoice in all of these promises. Over against that, we can think of the Neoplatonic view that slips into a few, very few of the, of the carols, where it, the, the, the virgin birth becomes a sort of never-never land, where the baby's glowing, and the stars are glowing, shining <laughs> down on him, and... And the baby never cries, and it's a silent, quiet night, despite the fact that children are being butchered by Herod's soldiers. You know, it's it, it just becomes this this <laughs> otherworldly kind of thing, which is the last thing it was. It was God stepping into our bloody, filthy history to reclaim it. And we would do well mm-hmm. to remember that at this time of year. I have a pet peeve about Christmas hymns that are written between 18, about... 1840 and 1870 because yeah, they right. all do that they're the worst yes yeah 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 that, that the time frame's about right somewhere along the line we began to get some better ones but interestingly enough they came out of the charismatic movement oftentimes for the very well think about it what's the emphasis of the charismatic movement the power of the holy spirit and whereas good Reformed Christians, we wouldn't buy into everything our charismatic brothers believe, but certainly we can we can agree with them that the Holy Spirit is sovereign and powerful and does incredible things. And so when they wrote about um, the bells ringing that Christ is born, uh, we can say, "Yeah, man, brother, preach it. This is true. It is mm-hmm. it is a change. It's at least it's a step away from the um, Gnostic fundamentalism of the time period you described." But if you go back to someone like Charles Wesley, then we we have solid scripture, uh, scripture upon scripture, reminding us of who Jesus is as a second Adam, come to undo the work of the fall, born to raise the sons of earth, born to give them second births. So this parallel that you just mentioned between the first coming of Christ and the second coming of Christ, that we live in this period of victory, although we wait for the greater victory to come, the the already and the not yet. I would add something, and and, um, Mm -hmm. our friends at Westminster are very, very good at pointing out the already and the not yet. What they miss most of the time, at least, at least I keep hearing that same expression, already, not yet. Yes, true. But... Well, let's, let's, let's look at um, the Christian Christian soteriology. The already, I'm born again. I'm converted. I have eternal life. I have the Spirit dwelling within me. The not yet, um, I have not yet been raised from the dead. I have not yet seen Jesus face to face. Is there some major doctrine of the Christian life missing here? How about progressive sanctification? There is an already, and there is an ongoingness. Mm-hmm. And then there yeah. is a it final the in-between, time, the in-between which is not a mm-hmm. flat, stale in-between. It's not sitting in um, the waiting room of, a, of the uh, train station, tapping your foot, waiting for something fun to happen. Nor is it the in-between of the prison camp where we are slashed to our bunks every night because Satan is so powerful and strong. It's the in-between of growth in the face of suffering, growth in the face of trial, and sometimes 
when God feels like growth and the tremendous outpouring of his spirit because he decides he's going to give this thing a head start and we get the Reformation or the uh, Wesley Whitfield revivals or some some of these kind of things where God just says, yeah, you need a little extra help here. Here, my spirit's going to do some cool stuff. Watch. And it's a mistake to think that God's going to rescue our grits every time that way. He generally doesn't. Most of covenant life is pretty every day, one step at a time, going to church, raising, discipling our children, performing our calling, and and hoping and planning and trying to make the next generation come out a little better than we did. And Christians, particularly American Christians, we're so bad at this. Uh, well, I don't see much change. Okay, let's go back and talk about about my grandma. <laughs> Um, from bu- horse and buggy to moon landing, you don't see much change. I wasn't even a hundred years. Well, An American culture, our our attention span is so short. Yeah. Like we can't sit still for five minutes, let alone watch generational progress. Like, yeah, if it's not going to happen in our lifetime, then it's not important, and it's not even really particularly real. We we don't think generationally anymore. Uh, the, uh, the Christians of Europe built uh, cathedrals, oftentimes realizing that all, as they contributed their little piece to this door or that hallway, that they would never get to worship there. But they believed that their grandchildren, their great-grandchildren for 100 generations would worship there. And in many cases, they proved right. They saw a long term. You build cathedrals from that kind of vision. You worship in a warehouse from a very different sort of vision. Now, that's mm-hmm. not to say that worship in a warehouse is always bad. Sometimes there are pragmatic reasons that it may be useful and necessary. But if the whole church is content to um, not institutionalize, not own property, not build buildings, and not build beautiful buildings, then mm-hmm. culturally we've already lost. And we need to go back and yeah. re-examine our theology and see what's wrong. Because the God who built the universe, the God who created Eden, the God who's building the New Jerusalem, does not delight in junk. He delights mm-hmm. in beauty and excellence. And so that's what we push for, realizing we may not see it in our lifetime and having to be okay with that. Having to realize that those little glimpses of glory that we get along the way, we'll have to do for now. Someday when Jesus comes, we will see the beauty, the form, the order behind all of this. For now, we walk by faith. We halt towards Zion. We limp along in our own sins and limitations and those of our brothers and sisters in Christ, bearing the ways and mistakes of the church of the past and trusting that somehow in all of our weakness, God will do something better according to his timetable, which may be a whole lot longer than ours. God says he's faithful to a thousand generations. Uh, If a generation is, what, 40 years, 20 years we're known we're near that time limit yet. We got a long way to go. Uh, and so we uh, get another element of the Christian philosophy of time. Time's not going to be up anytime soon. And in the meantime, we are in this in-between time, which is a time for being productive, for being useful, for growing, for developing our own talents and gifts. Because, you know, when, when Jesus comes, if I've learned calculus, I'm still going to know calculus. If I've learned physics, I'm still going to know physics. My knowledge of biology might be a little off because the resurrection body is probably a little different from the <laughs> current one. If I was a mortician, well, well physics might be a little different physics, too. Physics may bounce around <laughs> a little bit. If I, if I was a mortician, well, that's gone. Um, <laughs> but there are great. If I'm a, if I'm an artist, those skills carry over. If I was an actor, that that comes with me. All of these things are not lost. They, they, we have the beginnings and then we have an eternity to build and perfect them. And that's encouraging for the, the technologists among us too. Oh, absolutely. Who work, work in, in things that seem so temporary, but we have an eternity to grow and develop in those things too. Like untainted by sin. What we are seeing is the barest beginning. So that's, as I say, sometimes I sit back mm-hmm. and talk, think about these things for a few minutes and then give it up because... It, it, it will be wonderful, but we can't even begin to conceive. But that has to be there, at least as a living concept, lest we get the idea that all of this stuff in the in-between, all of this stuff that is progressing is worthless. That we were, okay, we're the children of God, and one day Jesus is coming back, and in between we just kind of tap our feet, and, and that's it. And nothing really else is supposed to happen. 
one writer uh, put it very elegantly when he said that um, there is literally nothing else that God has promised us until Jesus comes back. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. <laughs> just, just as a side note, this, this is a, a, a pet peeve of mine. So are there um, people groups, languages, clans, tribes that have not yet heard the gospel? All right. So they're not included in the people Jesus <laughs> decided to die for. He, he didn't die for them. He didn't plan on saving them. They don't count. They don't have any part in eternal glory. They're the unwashed, the unclean. They're the others. They're the not, well, they didn't quite make it, did they? This is a terribly racist eschatology and philosophy. Mm -hmm. And if you say, and a question that I would like to ask some people who share this sort of eschatology is, exactly at what point were there no more promises to fulfill? Was it when Jesus went back to heaven, well, presumably, okay, it was still the spirit. Okay, well, there was the expansion into the empire that was promised, right? Destruction of Jerusalem, maybe the fall of Rome. So to Christianity or the barbarians, 313, 476. So it sounds like someplace by 500, about the time that Arthur passed, God was done with all of his promises. So all of those tribes that, and those peoples, who had never heard the gospel, really had nothing to count on and shouldn't expect God to reach out to them because there were no more promises to fulfill. Really? I, I assume if I got to sit down with this man who's a pastor who's written some books and put it bluntly like that, I assume he would say, oh, no, that's not what I mean. Well, it's what you said. And words matter. And they matter in terms of their social implications. And they matter in terms of how we view other people. Because when we start talking about history, we are talking about people. We're talking about other people. We're talking about people who have not been born yet. We're talking about people in other parts of the world that we haven't gotten to yet. And we are, but we are most certainly talking about people. So there's uh, eschatology is wrapped up in sociology and wrapped up in that simple Christian word called love. It does matter. And it matters forever. Mm -hmm. I've just realized that we made all these Christmas references, but this episode won't be published until after the holidays. Maybe we'll make it in before Epiphany, though. <laughs> well, and, and it's still Christmas for, uh, what, are Greek Orthodox friends? Oh, that's right. We can just say we're on the Eastern calendar. <laughs> yeah. There you go. That's, this is halting towards Zion, always on the Eastern calendar <laughs> when it's convenient. <laughs> oh, well, that get me in trouble. <laughs> Well, that is all the time we have for tonight. So thank you so much, Greg, for this conversation. Thank you, Emily. Thanks to David, our producer, my lawfully wedded husband. And thank you all for listening. Uh, send us an email with questions or feedback of any sort at haltingtowardsion at gmail.com. See you next time. <laughs>